Kalazar is endemic in Ethiopia for, for centuries, but uh, the MSF history started in uh, 1997 when we were uh, starting a project in Humra Hospital, which is in the far northwest corner of the country, uh, and where we were confronted with uh, uh, many HIV patients and Kalazar patients uh, without access to care and who were dying on the streets. Those patients were mainly uh, seasonal migrant workers, because this is in the, in the lowlands where you have the big, uh, yeah, uh, cash crop farms, which uh, every year attract between 300 and 500,000 young adult males to work uh, on those farms uh, for the production of, of sesame seed, uh, cotton, uh, sorghum. Most of them come from the highlands, where there is uh, no immunity against uh, Kalazar or, uh, or malaria, and they, they work and they sleep in the fields uh, also during the night when the sand fly bites. So many of them that are there infected by, uh, by uh, Kalazar and, and become sick. Kalazar is a disease that is caused by a parasite and the parasite is transmitted from one person to another person by the bite of a sand fly. Now once the parasite has entered the body it uh, attacks different organs. It will uh, result in fever, uh, weight loss, uh, so severe malnutrition, uh, anemia, um, but it also attacks the, uh, the immune system. Uh, and because of the poor immunity of those patients, they are susceptible for all kinds of other infections like pneumonia or diarrhea or tuberculosis. And uh, uh, Kalazar is typically fatal if it's not treated. And usually they die of some of the complications like a severe pneumonia or a, a heart failure because of the anemia or malnutrition. And uh, so it's a serious disease. The other issue is that uh, uh, in this young male population there is uh, a relatively high uh, prevalence of HIV infection. And uh, that creates a, a unique situation that uh, we saw that, that between 20 and 30 percent of the Kalazar patients were HIV co-infected. And that is a combination of two diseases which are both severely immune suppressive and it's almost impossible to, uh, to cure. Because a, uh, an immunocompetent patient if he is treated for Kalazar, he will develop a, a, an immunity against the disease, which will be for many years or even lifelong. But HIV co-infected patients, they cannot generate this immunity, so they will relapse and relapse and relapse, and eventually they become unresponsive to, uh, to treatment and, uh, and they die. So it's a very complicated uh, group to treat. But because of and the high prevalence of, of, of co-infection in these patients, it's a unique situation in the world where you can do research on, on, uh, on management of Kalazar in these, uh, uh, these uh, co-infected patients. So that's why over the years, uh, since 2000, uh, yeah, we have done uh, a number of, of, of studies and researches to try and improve the, uh, the management uh, and, and treatment outcomes of, uh, of uh, HIV co-infected Kalazar patients. S several of these studies have resulted in, 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 yeah, in global policy change. We saw that treatment of, of co-infected patients is, is very complicated and they are less responsive to treatment. Uh, in the past we only had uh, mono drug treatment, so treatment with only one drug, but we saw that uh, in co-infected patients that was not effective. There were a lot of failures. So we thought if we combine two drugs which are safe but have a different mode of action, and if we combine those drugs then we have uh, hopefully a better treatment outcome. And that's what we initiated in, in, uh, in Abdurafi and uh, with very good results. Uh, and that was reason for us to uh, engage with, uh, with other research partners 
the University of Gondar, but also Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative to do uh, larger studies. Uh, and these larger studies proved to be uh, successful. And this has contributed to uh, the, the World Health Organization to come up with uh, new guidelines on, uh, on the management of, and treatment of uh, HIV Kalazar co-infected patients. And these new guidelines have been published uh, a couple of months ago in, in 2022. Kalazar activity started in, in Humara from the hospital, but uh, in 2003 we created uh, some outreach sites uh, because we knew that access for patients to Humara was, was quite difficult. They had to travel long distances. And we thought, well, if we decentralize the, the, the treatment facilities, uh, we provide better access. Uh, and uh, so we have patients coming earlier and therefore in less severe disease and, uh, and, and lower mortality. And Abdurafi was uh, one of those outreach sites that was created in, in 2003. Um, eventually, we, uh, in 2009, we have handed over Humara Hospital to the Ministry of Health because they, we had supported them in creating the capacity and we moved our base to, uh, to Abdurafi, which was in a very remote, isolated area, but with uh, uh, yeah, large numbers of, uh, of migrant workers passing through in an area where no care for Kalazar was, was being provided. So since 2003, we've been, been working there. In those 20 years in Abdurafi, we have treated uh, close to 7,000 Kalazar patients. Uh, but overall in Ethiopia, we have treated more than 15,000 Kalazar patients. That was in Humara, in Abdurafi, but also in the late 90s, we had a response to a Kalazar outbreak in the far south, in the southern region, in, in Konzo where we responded, uh, and it's actually the region where now there is uh, a new outbreak occurring um, to which uh, uh, MSF is responding. What we, we saw in Abdurafi was that uh, we occasionally saw patients with snake bites, and we knew that because the, the migrant, seasonal migrant workers, they work in the fields, uh, often during the night, because it's a very hot climate, they, they work and they uh, and they travel during the night, they are easily exposed to, uh, to snake bites, uh, especially during the harvest when they have to uh, pick the sesame and, 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 and cut it. Until 2014, we did not have real uh, snake bite treatment services available. Um, but once we started to the, the com more comprehensive treatment for snake bites, including anti-venom treatment, then rapidly numbers of patients presented increased uh, from 145 in 2014 to uh, more than 1,400 in, uh, in 2019. Uh, word is spreading, patients were coming from further distances uh, because it's the only, uh, the only facility in the whole northern region where snake bite care is, is being provided with antivenom. Um, we still saw that um, a lot of patients, they first went to, uh, uh, before coming to MSF, they were visiting traditional healers who did a lot of sometimes very harmful interventions. But uh, yeah, with uh, the, the health promotion that we did on the farms, uh, in the communities, uh, this health seeking has a bit improved and patients are now coming more, uh, more often directly to, to MSF. Um, this is really also a life-saving activity uh, because yeah, uh, without treatment, uh, many patients will, will die because of uh, the, the, the snake bite complications. And um, well, since 2014, we have treated uh, now uh, some 4,800 uh, snake bite patients in, in Abdurafi. Um, and because of this high number of snake bites that we see, that is also another excellent opportunity to do research uh, for new antivenoms uh, and better antivenoms. Because what we are still 
looking for is an, uh, an antivenom which is uh, effective uh, for envenomation by all the important snakes in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, yeah, we are planning some, some further research now to, uh, uh, to evaluate new antivenoms and then hopefully come to better uh, treatment for, for snake bites, which uh, will also, of course, require a lot of advocacy uh, to make this antivenom available and affordable because it is, it's quite expensive. Uh, in Ethiopia, uh, if hospitals have uh, uh, antivenom treatment, then uh, yeah, patients have to pay for it out of pocket. And it's unaffordable for, for most patients, uh, poor patients. Uh, so that is an advocacy that we are uh, doing at the moment to, uh, yeah, to, for uh, national governments, but also donor organizations to, to, to support uh, snake bite uh, uh, programs. Uh, at least one of the successes that we have achieved is to get uh, snake bites on the World Health, World Health Organization list of neglected tropical diseases in uh, 2017. And uh, because it's now on this uh, neglected tropical disease list, uh, yeah, the, the World Health Organization has uh, uh, more leverage to push governments to be, and, and donors to become more active in, in providing this care which is almost yeah, hardly existing in, in, in most of the, the countries here. They're called uh, neglected or neglected tropical diseases because they typically uh, are prevalent in, in, uh, in low income countries, in, 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 in tropical climates. Uh, and diseases which are neglected uh, uh, first by uh, uh, national governments, they are seen as lower priority diseases because they affect the poorest of the poor very often in remote isolated uh, areas far away from the political centers uh, people without political voice uh, secondly uh, neglected by pharmaceutical industries because they are not for them it's not commercially interesting to develop new drugs or diagnostic tests for a disease which yeah uh, affects the poorest of the poor, so it will not generate uh, a lot of, of, of profit. And thirdly, neglected by uh, the donors, the big donors, because they tend to focus on uh, yeah, lower hanging fruits, diseases that can easily be controlled with relatively uh, easy interventions. And that's why uh, MSF is focusing on the neglected tropical diseases, which are much more complicated to, uh, to diagnose, more complex to treat, and more expensive to, uh, to treat. And we will continue this uh, commitment to addressing uh, Kalazar and snake bites in, uh, in Ethiopia.